After a natural disaster like a fire or a cyclone, a critical part of the recovery phase of the emergency response is to determine, to determine the extent of damage to infrastructure, property, and communities. Understanding that aspect of the impact of the event is key to making informed decisions around the restoration of normal. And all that has to happen in what is typically a very complicated multi-stakeholder environment that is going to include multiple emergency services, the insurance industry, local government, utility companies, and potentially many more, and of course, the population that were impacted by the event. And that determination is never easy. Traditionally, it would have involved sending teams out into the field when it was safe to do so, to walk the ground, to visually inspect the extent of the damage, record it, and bring that information back to base to drive decision making. More recently, as access to remotely sensed imagery from drones, for example, has become more timely and economical, the options for using technology and that data to improve the process and potentially speed it up have improved dramatically. But even armed with the data and the technology, it can still be a very manual and time-consuming process to categorize what represents damage in aerial imagery. And staff who've done it many times before can still only assimilate and process that data at a certain rate. If you try and speed up the process by throwing extra bodies at the problem, you run the risk of introducing inconsistency in approach and potentially inaccuracy in the data. So if we could speed up that process while still maintaining really high levels of integrity, consistency, and accuracy, it could have a profound effect on how soon problems get resolved and how soon those whose lives were impacted by the event can get their lives back on track. Let's have a look at a real-world example of how this might be achieved using new deep learning capabilities in the ArcGIS platform. Ta? Thanks, Josh. Now, it's early January 2013, and the conditions in southeast Tasmania are dry and windy. The temperatures are in their 40s, and the fire danger rating is high. Now, this particular summer was nicknamed the Angry Summer, with 123 weather records being broken over a 90-day period across Australia as a whole. And it seems we're seeing those same trends in New South Wales and in Queensland at the moment. Now, over the two days of the 3rd and the 4th of January, strong winds from the northwest drove these conditions further south, and many fires burned across Tasmania including a particularly severe fire in the coastal township of Danali east of Hobart. This particular fire event was estimated to have caused close to $90 million worth of damage, with over 200 homes destroyed, hundreds of businesses affected, and a seriously negative impact on the local economy. Now, thankfully, no lives were lost during the fire event itself. However, there was one fatality during the mop-up after the event. Today, using imagery kindly provided by Tapupui and Tasmania, as well as supporting imagery from DALP in Victoria, we want to explore how we could speed up the process of damage assessments in this scenario. So what we want to be able to do today is to rapidly detect damaged structures and properties using the imagery at our disposal. And we want to be able to do this in a repeatable and consistent fashion. So what is it that allows us to approach this problem differently? It's kind of a meeting of minds, the intersection of data science, GIS, and AI. The field of AI has been moving forward dramatically in recent years to the point where now computers and AI can match or even surpass us humans at certain activities like language translation, reading comprehension, and image recognition. It's that intersection of those two disciplines and the ability for us to now start using AI, machine learning, and deep learning capabilities intrinsically inside ArcGIS that opens up a whole new range of possibilities for spatial analytics that were previously out of reach for most users. It's important we break down what we actually mean by these terms because they're used somewhat interchangeably. By artificial intelligence, we refer to activities that computers are undertaking that would have traditionally been thought of as requiring a certain level of human intelligence. Under that umbrella term, machine learning is a way of having computers use data-driven algorithms to strategize about how to build problem-solving solutions around a particular data set. 
And then deep learning, a subset of machine learning, which specifically uses computer-generated neural networks to build those problem-solving strategies and data analysis capabilities. But these capabilities are not, strictly speaking, new to ArcGIS. Geoprocessing tools have been using machine learning techniques for some time now. So, for example, the maximum likelihood classification tool in Spatial Analyst uses machine learning approaches and is often used to classify land cover. And the geographically weighted regression tool in the Spatial Stats tool set also uses machine learning algorithms. But these tools require an expert user to feed them with the parameters, the factors that are going to deliver a, a great outcome. Wouldn't it be great if the tool could figure out what those factors are just by looking at the data itself? And this is what we're going to take advantage of in the analysis we're going to be doing, um, taking advantage of that intersection to explore and exploit a couple of different approaches that support our aim of detecting damage in post-event imagery rapidly. Now these capabilities are exposed through ArcGIS Pro and the ArcGIS.learn module of the ArcGIS Python API. And we'll be taking a look at both of them to perform our analysis today. Now if you aren't familiar with the ArcGIS Python API, it's a bit of a quiet achiever, something you might not have even heard of yet. So it's a Python library designed to work with geospatial data and maps, and it's powered by WebGIS. Now it's been designed to do everything from the detailed analysis we'll undertake today through to managing items and users in your portal. But most importantly, it's tightly integrated with the Python ecosystem, the scientific Python ecosystem, with built-in support for deep learning frameworks, the types and likes of which we'll use to do our analysis today, including TensorFlow and PyTorch. Now look, this might sound as though it's a little bit outside of the realm of GIS, but please stay with us. We are sure that by the end of this, you'll see that these capabilities are well within your reach. We won't lie, there's a wee bit of a learning curve, but let us draw an analogy that'll help put that learning into perspective. Now I'm sure a number of us have come across some really complex and hectic geoprocessing and model builder scripts. And even though we could run the script, we thought to ourselves, how on earth did that work? So we could run it and we could see the result, but understanding how we got to that final result and then how to refine the result came after we'd spent a little bit of time with the tool. And it's the same deal with these new deep learning tools. They're new and they're a bit different, but stick with them and you'll quickly get it. Right now we're just here to get you thinking about the possibilities of these new tools. If you are interested, however, in diving deeper, we have a couple of more technical sessions on Python and machine learning. So join Josh and a couple of my colleagues in the Accelerate track this afternoon and check them out. Then straight afterwards, join us in the Innovate track where we'll teach you techniques and best practice about how to incorporate these new advancements in technology as part of your organization's adoption and GIS strategy. Okay, so let's look at this type of analysis that's been applied to the scenario in Danali. Now the ingredients that we have to work with are a post-fire imagery, high resolution, that was taken after the fire event on the 15th of January in 2013. And we'll also be working with a building footprints feature class. Now our post-fire event imagery will provide us with examples of damage, and we can use this information in a couple of different ways. Now the first way that we can use the information is to ask the question, where is the damage? And that's a lesson in object detection. Essentially we're saying to the tool, here's what damage looks like. Learn what damage looks like and then infer that skill to showing us the location of damage properties. Now the second way that we can ask the question is to say, okay, we've taught you what damage looks like. Now why don't you tell us from all of the imagery and data that you have, which of these properties are damaged and which are not damaged. And that's a lesson in feature classification. It's similar to detection, but it uses a different deep learning tool in the background. Now, our deep learning tools are smart, but they do need some initial data to build their internal modeling and inference capability. So we'll start off by exploring the object detection lesson and we'll build a model and train it first. Now, the new export training data for deep learning tool in ArcGIS Pro is a tool for the job. 
using the imagery at our disposal, we'll select a sample of damage, and then we'll be able to wrap it up in a format that our deep learning tool can then use for its internal training. So our format would be an output of a folder containing images also known as chips. And these chips will have individual descriptions, which will give our modeling tool information to then know the difference between the damage and the undamaged. Now here we have our folder, and here we have all of our images and chips which match the parameters we set out. This folder also includes a model definition file, which Josh will use to then define our training. Now with that done, I'll hand over to Josh who's going to tell us and show us how to train a detection model. So here we flip over to Jupyter Notebook and the ArcGIS Python API. I'm using something called a single shot detector deep learning tool here that's ready to roll in the ArcGIS.learn module. I pointed it at the training data that Tara has provided me with, and I give it an indication of what numerically to look for in the sample data to recognize damage. The model then makes a first pass of the data to help us confirm that the sample represents what we're looking at. And you can see examples here of where TAR flagged damage in the imagery. This is all leading up to something called determining the optimal learning rate for this model. This is a parameter that's going to drive the model's self-learned capability. And once we've established that, we can let the model loose on its first pass of the data, which takes some time and, and a number of iterations. Finally, we get to see the output of that model from its initial pass, and we get to measure its efficacy, its efficiency, if you like. And we may go back and refine that by tuning the parameters. At this point, the now informed model is available to TAR for the next stage in the process. Thanks, Josh. Now, now that I have that new model that Josh has just created, I'll use another new tool in ArcGIS Pro to then perform inference and this will be the detection portion of our analysis. Now, the new detect objects using deep learning tool is the tool for the job. We can now ask the first question that we set out to answer. Now, this tool takes the inputs of Josh's trained model, as well as my imagery to analyze, and then it spits out a brand new data set showing the predicted locations of where the damage is. Now, it's important to note here that these locations are predicted based on our uh, training model. And that was about 68% if I'm correct. So our result to start with isn't bad. And I guess the more time we spend the tool, uh, we can then refine the output as well as our approach and a training and then get a better result. Now moving forward to our second question, where we want to understand which buildings are damaged and which are undamaged. This is the feature classification portion of our analysis. Now you'll start to see a trend here. The first thing that we do is create a training sample. But it's a little bit different now because we're using our builded footprints feature class. So now I have to select a bunch of footprints and then I manually label them as damaged or undamaged so that my tool understands its options. Then once I've created that training sample, I'll send it off to Josh. But before I hand over to Josh, let me run another scenario past you, which I'm sure a number of us are familiar with. Now, what would happen if I had an incomplete building footprint feature class? Am I able to then use deep learning tools to go ahead and then create the missing pieces for me? Josh and I had a think about this, and then we had a go, and we found that we could. So what we were able to do is create an object detection model to then look at the imagery and then generate building footprints where we didn't have them previously. And this is another great way in which we can use these new capabilities and tools to then generate missing pieces for us. So now we're armed with a richer set of building footprints and with deep learning, I've created a new training sample, which I then share with Josh, we'll go ahead and create a classification model. So familiar territory and a slight twist this time in that I'm using a different deep learning tool, a feature classifier in this case. And I have to tell it about the two different states I'm looking for when it's training itself of damaged versus undamaged. Once again, the goal here is to do an initial pass to arrive at this optimum learning rate, which the model will then use to control its discovery of the data over a period of iterations. We can look at initial results of its detection capability inside the data we gave it, and we may choose to fine-tune our parameters and modify that learning rate if necessary. 
When the model's done its first pass, the inference is done in this case inside Python. And what will happen is this Denali building footprints feature class will be updated by the model to have two additional attributes, one being the prediction of whether the footprint, the polygon, is damaged or undamaged, and the second being its confidence in that prediction. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. And so now we have an answer to our second question, uh, which was which footprints are damaged and which are not. Now, this is a really great result, and we're pretty happy with our first pass. But again, by spending more time with this tool, we can refine our approach, our training, and our modeling, and get a better result. So now, within 20 minutes, we've used deep learning to visually access and assess either damage, or to then access and assess information about which properties are damaged and which aren't damaged. Now, these results are great, but what do they mean in the grand scheme of a natural disaster or in the aftermath? Well, I think having put that effort into doing that analysis, we want to continue the, the value chain, if you like, and get the most out of it. So one really easy win from that data would be to use it as the core of an operations dashboard, along with other contextual and operational layers, and perhaps the location of our assets and our people out in the field. This then puts everyone literally on the same page and it becomes the common operating picture that everyone's going to reach for when they want to understand where the recovery effort is up to. Now we mentioned before that the determination of impact isn't trivial. We've used deep learning to quickly assess visually the damage caused during the angry summer and we've done so quickly and efficiently. Two of our key objectives were repeatability and consistency, which means we've been able to create some new data and share that data with our key stakeholders. Our key stakeholders include our field responders, who can then use this information through applications like Collector for ArcGIS and Survey123 to then quickly access and assess the most at-risk populations. And again, using Survey123, they can quickly complete rapid damage assessments so that all of the victims can get the relief they need quickly. So thinking about the repeatability aspect of what Tan just said, how can we share the tradecraft? How can we share the analysis we did? Well, here's that same feature classification analysis in a Jupyter notebook, but this time it's an ArcGIS notebook server notebook. That's a new kind of WebGIS item in your portal that allows you to encapsulate all the code, documentation, results, imagery, and potentially maps inside this WebGIS item that can be shared. But as well as all of that, I can integrate with WebGIS, for example, by finding data in my portal, which I want to use in the notebook, and add it to my notebook with a single click. In a similar vein, if I wanted to take advantage of analytical tools in ArcGIS Enterprise, I can search for them, in this case a buffer tool, and also just with a click, add it to the notebook for use. And then when I'm ready to share with my peers and colleagues, it's just the same as any other WebGIS item. I select the scope of the sharing, click OK, and that's now available for reuse and repurposing. So this exercise has been all about exploring how these new deep learning capabilities can be used to expedite the process of recovery in an emergency in a repeatable and consistent way. And whilst we did it here on a fire event, we think it's got enormous potential for other scenarios where this kind of raster data, perhaps from drones, is the first visibility and most accurate visibility on a situation as it unfolded. So using these new capabilities, we've managed to undertake this analysis and take it from weeks down to a couple of hours and present our results in minutes. So this means we've cut down on time and assessment costs. And now all of our stakeholders including public safety agencies, utilities companies, local councils, as well as the victims, can benefit from all of this information in a quick and efficient manner. So this morning, using ArcGIS deep learning and machine learning, we've managed to see what others can't, which enables you, our stakeholders, to continue doing what no one else can. The so changing tack completely. If you're into GIS and you're into podcasts, then watch out for the upcoming ArcGIS Directions podcast series where Tar, myself, and our colleague Wayne Lee Archer are going to be navigating our way through a series of really interesting spatial topics in the early part of next year. As well as encouraging you to tune in and listen, we'd like to hear from you. We'd like to know what kind of topics you'd like us to take on and discuss. 
So if you're keen to find out how to confirm your true location, or you wanna find out how to craft the perfect, how do I explain what do I do barbecue pitch, then join us in January and start your new year with a new layer. Like Josh said, we're keen to hear from you. So please do register your interest at Esri Australia slash GIS Directions Podcast. And let us know what you want us to cast out to the GIS community. We can't wait to cast with you. Thank you. Thank you.